So did you guys see my tournament blooper, dude? Where where I totally screwed up. <laughs> do a little tournament recap and I made some good decisions and I made some bad decisions it's like any derby but I thought what was really cool and if you guys want to watch the whole video go back um, I'll put a little link to it uh, we have the whole tournament I actually shot it on my title mount which I mounted on my uh, precision sonar my graph bracket so I got kind of like everything you know you can see exactly what happened what I was fishing in that and it was a cool day for me personally because it was an adaptive day I ended up doing something and getting all my big bites on something I 100% did not expect would play a big role in the day but let's break down tournament day i'm going to tell you exactly what i did exactly what i fished and how it all went down and the mistakes that i made hit that like and subscribe button let's talk derbies so first off thanks to you guys who've been super supportive with me getting back into some tournament fishing i hope you guys are enjoying any of the videos found a great group of guys to fish with at that aba and they're hammers dude and it's been cool i'm a newbie you know i like these local guys are sticks and it's been cool seeing how i adapt in that tournament situation kind of the decisions that you make and also to see if a newbie like me can hang with these guys and maybe even win one of these so it's it's been a cool process so thank you guys but let's get to it i had a totally I had a, i'd say fluid plan for the tournament and it all went to bleep uh, like that way i won't have to bleep it out on the video uh, so what I was going to do is this, and it started off pretty good. Um, in the morning, I, I was going to fish little groups of fish, five or 10 fish. They're not so much schools, but small groups of fish on hard spots, on ledges, your classic offshore fish. But what happens during the summer is, you know, on your lake, you probably see it too. You get a lot of pressure. These fish get very selective, very moody. And really that window in the morning or late in the evening is the best time to actually get bites and catch them. So my, my goal was to try to catch five decent ones maybe get lucky and luck into like a four to six pounder in the morning and then go search for bigs and just pick off one fish here and there so in the morning i started off throwing that carolina rig i actually got a couple three three and change pound bites um they were there not as there as they've been um the reason i chose the carolina rig is i couldn't get bit on my, my little texas rig worm anymore these fish have been suspended they weren't running much current that carolina rig even though i absolutely hate throwing it is a great tool when you have fish that that aren't glued to the bottom they're a little bit off the bottom, but you still want to present that that sort of weedless Texas rig worm presentation. And I was using the same bait I used on a Texas rig. It's just a you know a five inch ace. Magic cross seems to be uh, the color that's magic for me, dude. I catch them day in and day out, dirty water or not, on Gunnersville on that magic crawl. I wanted a stick bait because I wanted it to do nothing. I knew where these fish were. I didn't need to draw them in. It was more of a question of like tricking them, getting them to bite, and I felt less action was more in this situation. That's what it seemed to kind of across the board. What I ended up doing, where I actually cleaned up and, and got to, I think I ended up having by about 10 o'clock, 17 and a half pounds. And what was really interesting is these fish were so so neutral or negatively mooded like in such a negative mood I actually ended up trolling up like I throw that Carolina rig I'd catch one or two and then I'd actually troll up and, and see them down and this is a great example of where that active target 2 comes into play I'd actually see them exactly where they were supposed to be there were less fish and they were a little more spread out and then I would grab um, I would grab this guy, which is just a little Nico rig. I either use this one. I think this is a missile baits quiver. Um, had a little eighth or a. Um, eighth ounce or a 3 16 ounce uh, little nail weight on there with a bkk circle hook um just a, a classic nico rig just like that eight pound fluorocarbon pretty light the other one that was killer and i think this played into the the neutral bait mood is this berkeley max scent super traditional like crawler style worm this is the hit worm magnum that guy right there um i'm not a huge believer in scents but i've seen like bait fuel work i've seen max scent work and these fish were not in a good mood and what i'd do is i'd roll up to them and do basically what i do noodle dicking with like a drop shot or a tamiki rig but with that nico rig i'd see one or two i'd pitch my bait out five to ten foot 
and you know just shake it or just let it on the bottom like right behind them and kind of slow drag it through and that's where i missed i had like a four and a half to five and change uh, that I, I didn't know she bit she like grabbed it on the way down as i pitched to her and she swam it would have definitely helped it wouldn't have won the tournament but it definitely would have helped um but i picked off a few three and a half pounders doing that which just goes to show sometimes if you're not getting a bite on your on your spot and you do have forward facing don't be afraid if, if they're not biting and you're going to leave anyways, troll up on them, kind of pan around, see if they're laid out a little differently than what you were thinking like during pre-fishing, during the practice days. And don't be afraid to pitch a little bait down there, a little lighter kind of finesse style bait to try to pick one or two off because one or two is better than none, right? And that really played, man. I had some three and a half pounders. I didn't end up weighing many of them in, but they definitely gave me some confidence to make some other decisions. So we got to about 10 o'clock or so. I think I had like 17. Um, I ran around, ran a couple other ledges, ended up throwing a shaky head um, through the chatterbait mini a little bit, and basically was picking up clones. I'd catch like a three five, I'd catch a three six, I'd catch a three two, you know? And it came to a point where I was calling like barely ounces like 0 0.10 0 0.20 now the big key with with derby day that day is there was a huge storm and front that was going to go through at about 11 30 or so um strong winds 15 to 25 winds and so that really spooked me because my concept was is i was going to end up grabbing one of these guys out right here and um, basically go pick off that's the bait sanity glide bait um and then i had a chad chad and I was going to go and basically run these schools and try to pick off one or two big ones. Um, Jacob taught me, Jacob Wall, my buddy from MLF, um, taught me how to kind of do this chalk glide deal. And you don't catch a lot of fish, but I can draw out like a five to six pounder. And I figured if I could catch one or two of those to add on to my three and a half to fours, you know, I'd have a good bag and a, a bag that would weigh in and have a potential of winning. And the trick is a lot like that hover rig with that glide bait, you need conditions that are conducive to throwing it because it is very much a forward facing sonar our technique and it started blowing and I'm like dude I'm SOL like I, I can't do this not only that the wind is blowing against the current which on Gunnersville means it's very hard to line up with these fish even if there's very minimal current which there was that day so at about 10 30 11 o'clock I'm like dude I need to change like the school thing I can catch three and a half all day which for a video would be awesome for a tournament I'm going to need something that's going to be a little more of a kicker so I need to kind of go full send and uh, go big or not go you know not go at all um, so I put the glide bait down because I was having trouble getting them to commit because I was having trouble lining up and I had found a small mat stretch dude and it was isolated very much Florida style isolated kind of domes of chop grass and hydrilla and junk and uh, I had rolled in there, I think the day before on practice, and usually I shake fish off, but I really wanted to know if there was anything in there and what kind of quality. So I grabbed um, a classic punching rig. Uh, this is just a one and a quarter ounce, uh, you know, tungsten weight. I had a one and a half as well. Um, a little BKK, I think that's the four aught flipping hook. I've been playing around with that instead of the hack attack. There's a lot of brim in these mats. And uh, this guy right here, it's the, um, the Stinger, the Gambler Stinger, has a little more of a kicking appendage. And I find that in, in late summer, before we get to kind of fall, fall, I like that BB Cricket and less kind of, less action appendages but while that water's still really warm and while there's so many brim in those mats in late summer I like a, a flipping bait that has a little bit of kick maybe even like a burner craw um, I went through during practice I pitched I think five five little dome mats pumped the bait and, and caught like a three and a half and I caught a four and I'm like cool I'm just gonna leave this if I want to run in here I can so about 11:30, I ran in there and uh, just started pitching literally with zero expectations and what's interesting too is it, this tournament I think was very much on a transitory or transitionary kind of time um, when it comes to fishing these fish tend to go deep and then as summer gets later and later they kind of shift back to the grass and so there were still fish out deep there are fish shifting to the grass so they're a little bit spread out so I think I made a good decision because I, I get in there I catch like a, a dink and then I catch like a three and a half and I call out one of my low threes I'm like that was cool you know let's keep it moving I end up catching a four and a half I'm like damn dude it's game on one of the big tricks was though you had to focus on on these little holes that were created by this dead chop grass in the in the mat so that's the only way you could get through it was so super thick that if you didn't target these little holes you weren't going to get through the mat the other key was not on all the bites I got on the mats but on some I was basically doing like we do old school Florida 
it like spring fishing. You'd pitch in there and you'd basically yo-yo the bait and five, six, seven times. This is isolated kind of like, I don't know, chunky mats. So you're able to pick it apart a little bit more. If I was going down like an extended grass line for a mile, I'd probably just be drop and flip, you know, drop in, drop out, drop in, drop out, and kind of power flipping it. With this, it was a little more of a pick it apart kind of approach. So I yo-yoed, catch four and a half, and I'm like, dude, I I'm gonna, rip this up i'm gonna hang out here for a while I ended up catching another four and change and then a couple more high threes really that little session in about an hour and a half two hours put me in what i had weight wise that 21 i think 21.10 or something like that um i made a couple mistakes uh, one obviously i broke the rod like an idiot never grabbed the rod that high flipping but one mistake that i made is the wind started blowing that front that we talked about went through and I'm like, dude, it's really getting tough to flip these mats. I need to get out of here. But the reality is, is where was I going to go? The whole lake's blowing. It, it, the wind is strong. I can't do my glide bait approach. Even the, the schools that I had, the little pods of fish on those hard spots, they're going to be hard to fish because there's two to three footers out there. So one mistake I made was leaving. Like I should have never left. Um, ironically, I went back there about three days later, ended up catching two fives. I, I caught, went back another few days, caught like two fives. So there were more fish and there were quality fish. It was just a question of staying in there and picking it apart. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two, it, it's not as much a mistake as it is just a reality. When you flip heavy cover, mats, whatever, I don't care how perfect you are with your technique, with your aesthetics, with how you do it, you are going to lose fish. Flipping is a numbers game. It's a numbers game when it comes to making drops and it's a numbers game when it comes to getting bites. You need to get enough bites so that you can lose a couple and you need to make enough drops where, where you're actually covering water and, and you're putting the bait in front of the fish because it's a very close quarters technique. And um, I lost two giants. Uh, one of them, I pitched in, ate it on the drop, donk, and the wind was blowing me in. I reeled up and I basically, these fish were darting away. I set the hook and it was not enough leverage because the boat was drifting. And that was a big one. I don't know whether it was four pounds. I don't know whether it was seven pounds, but it was big. Cause I know when it comes to flipping, when I get a bite like that, what's on the other end. Um, the other one was just a, a reality. And, and that's, I pitched in, I set the hook. She's on there for like a one, 1,000, two, 1,000, everything. She's bouncing around and comes off. That's just one of those things you got to deal with with flipping. It's the risk that you take. But I think the reality is with the, the transitioning type of situation we were in during that tournament, it's something to keep in mind on your lakes. You know, there's a lot of things going on at once. There is oftentimes there's one dominant pattern but it doesn't mean it's the only thing going on and having those little kind of nooks and crannies especially on a lake like gunnersville that's so pressured where a lot of guys are doing the same things because it actually works you know community holes are community holes for a reason a lot of guys catch fish there but it doesn't mean there's not little like side tweak patterns kind of like the little mat deal that i found that it's a small area you have to pick it apart you got to sit there for a while it doesn't mean that that stuff can't win and a lot of times that's going to be your juice hole i literally called out half my fish on a stretch of about 100 yards and and that's what put me at 21 for for a third place finish in the derb um i really wish i would have stayed though there were some bigs there and i really think my stubbornness and picking things apart when it comes to flipping really could have paid off there but that's would have should have could have right we all do that during a derby looking back but it's something to learn for the future and to know for the future if you're getting bites what, what is i forget who even says it but you never leave fish to go find fish and and i left fish to to try to dabble around and i should have known the conditions because of that front because of that wind it wasn't going to be conducive just about anywhere so if i had fish that were biting slow down pick it apart and make something happen. But it, it was an awesome day. I really like these guys that I fished these couple derbs with. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Catching it on the Tato Mount was pretty cool. It was cool to go back and reflect. Uh, but the key and uh, the, the real lesson I took away was adaptability. Have, develop your, your sort of your mainstream patterns. I had these hard spots, I had these schools, and then I had a way to try to catch bigs using that glide bait. It all went down the toilet after about 10 o'clock. So I had one, and if it didn't work, I would have been SOS but I had one little sort of sideline back pocket pattern that was completely different from all the rest stuff that I was doing 
And that was 100% a huge play for calling up and getting some big bites and just changing up the game plan of the day. I just wish I would have committed it to it a little bit more because I think, I don't know if I could have got 23, I think 7-1, and then there was another guy with a, like a low 23. So there were some big weights, but the reality is I think my smallest fish was 3-6 or something. So one six pounder would have completely changed my bag because I had stout ones to go with it. I needed one six or two fives. Um, it was a pretty easy call up. There's a lot of big fish on Gunnersville. Just never got there. You know, that, that's the reality. That's tournament fishing. But I highly enjoyed it. If you guys got any questions or anything to, to, to like tweak on the way I approach the day, I'd definitely like to hear it. Um, I, as I said, I'm getting just back into tournament fishing and especially on a lake that I've really never tournament fished before. It's been an interesting experience and uh, I definitely learned a lot. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you didn't watch it, go back and watch the tournament video. And I also have a pre-fish video of uh, going out and trying to find fish locate and identify some patterns i had a blast it, like you'll see some more of these tournament derby videos not a whole bunch we're not going to go full millican but we're going to play around with it a little bit you learn a lot when you go out and you compete and uh it, it was a lot of fun to pull a big bag 21 and change and uh pull it down to the scales dude a lot of hard work a lot of sweat a lot of tears but it, it pays off in the end hit that like and subscribe button we will see you back out on the water catching fish or talking bass